Good morning, everyone. Today is 15 March 2006. My name is Frank Kastner, and I'm a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve our country's history, especially World War II. In conjunction with the Veterans Oral History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts. Today, I have the honor and privilege of talking with Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Wilson, who is here with Marlene Milsky, and we are going to talk to him about his experiences as a B-24 pilot based at Wedling, England. <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel Wilson, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. I need you to start, sir, if you would please state your full name and spell your last name for us, please. Uh, Thomas Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N. Thank you. Um, could you tell us where and when you were born? <clears throat> I was born in 1922 in Glasgow, Scotland. And that was January 26th, 1922? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, Glasgow, Scotland. Um, how about your parents? Uh, their names? Um, Daniel and was my father's name, and Margaret was my mother's name. Okay. Um, do you remember anything about um, your home in Scotland? Oh, yeah. I was uh, eight years old. My father came first because of the worldwide depression. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know my dad, actually, <laughs> but because he left when I was such a small child. I see. And then, <clears throat> of course, when... My mother and I followed him because of the Depression. It first came to Europe, and then it came to America. But anyway, and uh, that's I lost my train of thought. And do you remember what what it was like in in Scotland during that time? Oh yes, oh yes. And I've been back. <clears throat> I was back during the war, as a matter of fact, and, uh -huh. and, and saw my my uh, my sister who. Is now deceased, but she never she never left Scotland. She mm -hmm. stayed there, mm -hmm. got married, and so on and so forth. Is that the only brothers and sisters? Just the one sister? Just the one sister. Yeah. Okay. Um, what did your father do when there? Do you know? Or he... my father was a steam fitter. Uh huh. And he worked. Uh, see, we see Glasgow is on the Clyde River where they built large ocean-going vessels, right. and that was what he worked on. He worked on ships. Was that one of the fitting. sites where they worked on the Titanic earlier, or was that...? Uh, the, the Titanic was, I think, further up or downstream. But in, was, in that general area? In that area. general area, yes. Uh, certainly known for its large shipbuilding oh, and, yeah, and yeah. That industry. Um, you said the, the Depression affected that kind of work. Um, how about individually? Uh, do you remember how it affected you living there, food sources, uh, that kind of thing? Well, <clears throat> no, I remember that things were just pretty much the same, but then I realized that there was something going on when my mother said that we were going to get on a boat and mm -hmm. go to America. Mm -hmm. so, How exciting. Yeah, and then I was uh, eight years old at the time, mm -hmm. I remember that, mm -hmm. and then my father uh, he came, God, I don't know, but not at the same time, a couple of years later, mm -hmm. when his things just got so tight in, in Glasgow that uh, he had to, he and his best friend, as a matter of fact, oh, no, his best friend, David Aird, had already gone over to America, and he wrote to my father, and said there was employment because mm -hmm. you know we're talking about the worldwide depression right right and, uh, and even though things were bad here there were places where it was much worse and yes um, you said you went to Europe first do you remember anything about the the trip from Scotland to here or well uh, I don't know what you mean I went to Europe first I, I, I thought you said you went to Europe before you from Scotland to Europe before you came to America, or maybe I misunderstood. 
Yeah, I don't think I did that. Okay. No, okay. I, but you sailed from um, Scotland then to yeah, the United States? Yeah, Greenock. Mm -hmm. Greenock, which is, was a big um, harbor, ship, mm -hmm. ship's harbor. And you were with your mother? With my mother, and I just, all I, I just drove her crazy on this <laughs> ship. I remember that because I just, we, we had a cabin, mm -hmm. which was, you know, there was steerage, it was a, was a big thing then, you know, where they put dozens and dozens of people in beds in the same room, mm -hmm. and, but we, for some reason, had a, had a, a cabin, and um, she claimed years later that she never saw me during the voyage. <laughs> I just took off. <laughs> Many things to see and do. Yeah. Do you remember arriving in America? I don't know if I do, or uh, yeah, yeah. I, what, what I do remember is, <clears throat> I think we came into New York. No, we came into Canada, mm -hmm. Halifax. I believe it was Halifax that, that we landed and had to go through customs there. That yeah, that's right. And then we took a train from Halifax to uh, the United States, mm -hmm. so. and. Um, did you meet your father then? Um, yes. Soon yes. after coming there, where did you settle? In Saginaw, Michigan. And do you know why there? Uh, yeah, because my father was a uh, a steam fitter, and his best friend David Aird already was over there, and told him that if he came to Saginaw, there would be a job for him mm -hmm. as a steam fitter. And mm -hmm. that's what happened, he mm -hmm. came to Saginaw. Do, do you remember what it was like living there then, in Saginaw? Oh yeah, I remember quite a bit about it, uh, even though I was just a, you know, eight years old. Uh, but, uh, you know, I lived there for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you went to school? Went to, went to junior high and high school in Saginaw. Do you remember the name of the this, this school? Uh, Saginaw High School, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and wait a minute here, on the tip of my tongue, Central Junior High School. Okay, okay. Um, did you like school? Yeah, I liked school. I was a reasonable student and went on to college and all that sort of what stuff. What were your interests in high school? What, what were your good subjects, what did you like most? Well, let me think about that, I don't know. Well, strangely enough, I think history I liked as much as anything, if not more. I didn't, uh, there was some stuff I didn't care for. Uh, uh, grammar, I mm -hmm. didn't care much for grammar. I ended up by teaching it, though, years <laughs> later. <laughs> um, were there any adjustment problems in terms of, of coming to America? Um. I, no, I don't th think so, s except that uh, I was the only person in the country that wore short pants in the middle of winter, <laughs> which was all, in Scotland you wore, a b a boys my age wore short, their trousers, you know, little mm -hmm. shorts. Mm -hmm. Year, year round, mm -hmm. because there wasn't that much of a degree difference yeah, in temperature. Yeah. And we, of course, we out here think Scotland is kind of chilly and damp. And yeah, well, it anyway. is, I guess. <laughs> <But> <laughs> it's what you get used to. Yes. Um, did you have uh, friends in high school that you've stayed in touch with? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't, right off the bat, I can't tell you their names, but. Uh, Oh yeah, well, there's, uh, for some reason I got into tennis, I don't remember what the deal was. Uh, oh, I think it, think it was they needed, there were some lo uh, local tennis courts at a place called Alumni Field and they needed someone to take money for the people that wanted to play, it was so much an hour, I forget what the hell. Mm -hmm. And so I did that, and by doing that, then I got interested in tennis. Mm -hmm. And I played tennis and went to college and played in college and all that. And that was, 
and met a lot of good people through tennis and and still know them and go, looking forward to going out to the tennis. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've done it before. And yeah. Um, any other things of recreation that you did that you can remember? Did you have a bicycle, for example, or things like that uh, growing up? I, uh, I'm i not sure about that, no. I'm not. Uh, well, I, you know, I know I didn't have a bicycle, but uh, <clears throat> I had some episode with a bike I remember. I don't know whether I blew the tire on it. <laughs> Because we lived on the with my grandparents on the third floor of a large apartment building, and then right across the street, of course, there was a candy store. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I think one time I got a hold of a bicycle and almost killed myself. <laughs> As children are apt yeah. to do. Uh, you said you lived with your grandparents. Uh, had they come over? Also earlier, never came. Or? no, they 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 never left mm. Scotland. Mm. Grandfather served in the World War. He was a sergeant major, which doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, I don't know what that is, but but he was a sergeant major in World War One, and uh, we lived with as I said, we lived in a, in, in a um, about a third story apartment and I can remember it was huge you know and, and we it was so big that the people I've mentioned so far lived there plus a renter a man had a room by mm. himself in mm. the same damn apartment mm. you know it was a Quite a big place, and apartment living is much more common in in oh yes over yeah, there than, yeah. than here. Yeah. Uh, when you came to uh, Saginaw, did you did you live in a house or lived in? Yeah, we lived in a house. Uh, I remember it vividly, and I've been back on a couple of occasions because I've got still a friends in Saginaw, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we lived in a house and. Right next to a field where they played softball, I remember that, and I became a bat boy. Oh, good. And it was good for me, but bad for my dad. He <laughs> came and sat on the bench with me one day, and the batter threw his bat and hit my dad on the head. For heaven's sake. And he had to go. We had to go to the go to the hospital and have his forehead sewn up, stitched up. Yeah. Um, did you work at all during? when you were in high school or have odd jobs? God, I can't remember that. Oh, I had a big, I had a, what I used to do, uh, I don't, they don't, I don't think this is, they've done this for a hundred years, but uh, selling extra newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then, and do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. All right, you know, that'd be, well, every time there was a big fight, mm -hmm. you know, They'd sell these extra newspapers, yeah. and I, as a kid, I'd go down to the to the um, to the uh, publisher, mm -hmm. you know, of these papers, and pick up a bunch. Yeah, of the papers. extra, extra, read all about it. Yeah, yeah that, that yeah, was what it was. Oh, yes, yeah. That's exactly what it was. Well, with before television and that kind of thing, that's the way people came up, yeah, kept right. up with changing events, that's and right. it was a very important part of how they uh, they kept in in touch with with what was going on. Um, do you remember the? Um, did you have a car or? Any, no, no, no. Did your Did your family have a car? Your parents? No, no. How did you get around? Streetcar, walk. But the street, the, the <clears throat> back then, uh, not many people had automobiles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember in Glasgow, but uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of of uh, transportation, you know, they mm -hmm. had buses and, mm -hmm. and, and trams, and that's what, that's... How what about I, in Saginaw? Yeah, that was a little different, because we went from a fairly large town to a fairly small town. But I think Saginaw had, Saginaw had buses, I mm -hmm. remember that, yeah. And your parents, did, did they have a car in Michigan? 
uh, my father, when we got over there, he had been over there first, he didn't have a car, then a friend of his did have a car, and they worked the same, at the same jobs. And, but I can remember this guy's name, the friend was a, was a, Frank Keen was his name. And <laughs> he was driving the car and the damn thing quit on him. I remember that. We were all in the back seat and he let out with a couple of oaths about it. And here we are parked. <laughs> In the middle of a street, the car won't move. Back in those days, he weren't that reliable. Mm -hmm. Did you um, did you have um, a girlfriend or someone in high school that you socialized oh, yeah. with? Yeah. Social yeah. activities, yeah, yeah, dances like that over here. That is yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I had two or three girlfriends, and you know, not heavy or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there were school dances that they used to were held. The, the, the dances that I remember were held after school, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and normally, I, the, my my school I don't remember seeming to have it so much, but across the Saginaw separated by a river, the Saginaw River, mm -hmm. a fairly good sized river. In fact. Uh, ships navigate right up to Saginaw mm -hmm. from the Great Lakes, and, uh, and Saginaw is on Lake Michigan. No, Lake. Sa no idea where Saginaw is. It, uh, Lake Huron. I. It's not. On I'm a from lake. back in there, and I, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. my geography. No, no, it's, but it's not on a lake. Saginaw is. But the river leads out yes. to one of the Great Lakes. Yeah, well, well yeah. Lake Huron. Lake Huron. Okay. Lake Huron. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, they had these dances. Um, one of the questions they, they want us to ask is, was there anyone you kept in touch with while you were overseas that you corresponded with or communicated with, wrote letters back and forth? Um? Yeah, I think that, that there was, but, but not, not, any, not any girls or anything mm -hmm. like that. It, it, uh, but I had buddies that were still in the States. And, mm -hmm. And I'd write a letter occasionally. So you did occasionally get mail or send? Oh, yeah, we got yeah, mm -hmm. email. Mm -hmm. uh, explain what, it, what what is that? Can't remember now, but it was a, oh, it was a, it was a, it was an envelope, a, a, a piece of paper that you could write on and then you folded it. And it became, became the envelope. It be, yeah, became yeah. The, very yeah. thin, yes. very lightweight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, you know, pretty reliable. It, it generally oh, got yeah, got there yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Um, you said in, that you um, went to college. Um, did you know have some idea what you wanted to do or what you wanted to study? <clears throat> and where where did you go to college? Where did you start? <clears throat> I'm trying to think about how I got there first. Just say. Oh, I know what happened. My best friend still is very close. Sandy Mellon. We were gonna, we were gonna go to the. Oh, the, oh, I know what it was. <clears throat> the University of Michigan, and <clears throat> which was the big school, you know, in in, in, in Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor, yeah, where we live, by the way. Uh, and uh, then we found out that we would be living in Nissan huts because of all the, the everybody getting out of the service and all that. They didn't have enough buildings for mm -hmm. this. And we both said to each other, we're not, damn it, we lived in enough Nissan huts. <laughs> We're not going to live in these nuts again. So at that time, my friend Sandy says, you know what we ought to do? He says, we ought to go where he had spent some time as a Navy reservist during the war at a school. He says, we ought to go to 
Ohio Wesleyan, which was in Delaware, Ohio. My mother went to Ohio Wesleyan. I, I don't know that we should discuss now. I'm from Columbus. Oh, great. Uh, I went yeah. to. I graduated from Ohio State. So oh well. Right, we have great. a we have a certain uh, yeah right <laughs> certain interest in Ann Arbor yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. various times, but. Uh, Yes, and, and again, my mother was from uh, from the Columbus area, and she graduated from uh, from Ohio Wesleyan. Okay, well, that's wonderful. When did she graduate? Oh, probably nineteen thirty-two. Yeah, she was born in nineteen fifteen, so she would have gotten out in in nineteen thirty-two yeah. or so. When did I? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. Forty-nine. I'm almost mm -hmm. sure. But you did you go to college at all before the war? No. So you, when you graduated from high school, you must have been around 1940? Yeah, 40, 41. One, yeah, yeah. Uh, June of, maybe June of 40? Yeah, it could be. I'm not, I'm not really remember that. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I, <clears throat> you know, everybody was getting drafted, mm -hmm. and I got a job in a gun plant that made automatic, that made machine guns for airplanes and uh, I stayed I did that for a while was this in Saginaw this was in Saginaw yeah the, God, the, the plant's still there hmm. uh, they don't do you remember the name of it but no we called it the gun plant because this is what it you know mm -hmm. and, but it had a name mm -hmm. but I don't okay I don't recall that and uh, and then uh, when the time came, uh, this my very good friend Sandy had been to Ohio Wesleyan with the Navy group. You know, they sent Navy had a program mm -hmm. where they sent you to college. You know, to, mm -hmm. you know, and he said, "Well, you know, what we ought to do because we're both University of Michigan fans." He says. Well, what I do is, you know, go to Ohio Wesleyan for a year, and there was a reason for it. And then we'll transfer. Oh, Michigan, you, you were if you went to Michigan at this time, you slept in Neeson huts. Mm -hmm. They were so overcrowded. Yeah. Okay. And we said, hey, we had enough <laughs> Neeson huts. So Sandy says, well, I'll tell you what we do. Let's go to Ohio Wesleyan for a year and then transfer mm -hmm. to Michigan. And, and they so were caught up by then, yeah. 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 So we never never left Ohio Wesley. <laughs> um, before the war then, as you graduated from high school, how aware were you of what was going on in Europe in terms of the, the war effort? Uh, the war over there, you know, we remember started in 1939. Yeah, yeah. Were yeah. you aware of that? Um, was it a concern? Did it have any effect on your plans of what you did after high school in, in any way? I don't really remember that, but you know, I was a kid and mm -hmm. I'm not sure I had great thoughts about what was going on in Europe, you mm -hmm. know, at the time. Well, the natural lead up then, of course, is um, we come to December 7th, 1941. Do you remember what you were doing that day? Uh, yeah. I do. I was at a movie, and I don't know if anything happened at the movie or not. But when we went out, got out of the movie, they were selling extra newspapers, and the headlines were "Japanese attack Pearl Harbor." Mm -hmm. I remember that vividly. Mm -hmm. Did you know anything about Pearl Harbor? No. <laughs> Did you know where it was? I don't think so. Any any idea of its significance in terms of why it was chosen as a target or? No, I learned about it, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it, you know, you know, people. In fact, uh, I, I'm almost sure I can remember people. More than one person say, "Well, where the hell's Pearl Harbor?" You <laughs> yeah. Know. Yeah. Was there any? Do you recall any sudden? movement to join the service within a few days you know any of your friends did you talk about it yeah uh, yeah and I don't know what happened to me but I had several friends that joined bingo mm -hmm. right off the bat you know mm -hmm. 
And I don't know what the hell I did. I, maybe I was chicken or something. <laughs> Um, you were um, you were nineteen. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Um, yeah. What? And you were working in the gun factory at, yeah, at this time. Yeah, called it the gun plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for the time being, you you kind of just stayed there and. Yeah. Um, how did you get connected then with the service? What uh, what led to that? All right, <clears throat> I vaguely remember this. There was a friend of mine whose name I could, whose face I can see. I can't remember his name. And he came up with a brilliant idea of joining the reserves, which we did. And we're immediately. <laughs> A few weeks or months later, drafted. Mm -hmm. I mean, not not drafted, but taken in. Called it. Called it. Yeah. Did you have to register for the draft? Do you remember? Oh yes, yeah, I remember that. I had to do that. Yeah. And, but that didn't lead immediately to, to a call up. No, no. So when you registered for the uh, reserves, were you sent anywhere immediately, or just told to go home and we'll get in touch with you? Oh yeah, yeah. I I I had I waited for weeks, so mm -hmm. you know before it, mm -hmm. and then they gave you a um, a notification. Things are beginning to come back to me, and I went down to the train station with my mother and father, and I'm headed for Miami Beach, Florida. Wow, bad duty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, before that, after, without automobiles and that kind of thing, you really hadn't traveled much away from Saginaw? No, not very much, no, no. So this was quite a big deal to, to be going to Miami, uh, yeah, Florida, on, yeah. the, on the train. Well, of course, I'd, you know, I had, I'd, my ship had come mm -hmm. over and all, so I had that, and I, my mother never saw me <laughs> once I got on board that <laughs> ship. I was running all over hell, you know. And, all that. and you had traveled from Canada by train, so you had some yeah. experience yeah. in that regard. Did they tell you what to take with you or what to pack? Um, oh, I don't remember that, but I would guess that they would tell you not to take anything mm -hmm. because he equipped you and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. So you reported to um, Florida. Anybody else from town go with you? Uh, no, uh, but, uh, yeah, they, you know, it, yeah, there was a guy named, ah, oh, Jesus, his father was a photographer, a commercial photographer, and his, his name was White, his last name was White, and he was sort of a buddy of mine, we went to dances together and stuff like that. And then you must have met others on the train headed in the same direction oh, as you sure, went south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So when you got to uh, Florida, do you remember the, the name of the installation, the training base? Well, as a matter of fact, it wasn't a training base. Uh, I mean, um, what, they, what they had done was they had called up all these people. They didn't know what the hell to do with them. Mm -hmm. So I was living in a three-story hotel that the government, army had taken over and uh, for the first week or so all we did was march mm -hmm. in civilian in civilian clothes we didn't have uniforms mm -hmm. either up and down the streets of Miami Beach <laughs> <laughs> now you and said I do remember another thing uh, they had a blackout and uh, I guess there's not anything more than to say about that. But everything at Miami Beach, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face mm -hmm. after after dark. Mm -hmm. And they were they had patrol. Well, they had uh, they had uh, Navy guys that patrolled the beach to be sure that nobody. <laughs> seems kind of ludicrous right now, but. 
and I, 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 I asked someone about this. What the hell are these guys doing on the beach? Christ, it's midnight. And uh, what the hell's going to happen? They couldn't. Nobody could come ashore. You, you can swim out about it. Well, that's that's uh, to report the enemy. Mm -hmm. That's what they were there for to be sure that. Well, there were German, German submarines oh, sure, in the Gulf. Were, oh, I mean, right, you know, well, right yeah. off the, they yeah. were off the coast of yeah. Miami. Yeah, yeah. around yeah. Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have to, we have to be, <laughs> yeah. have to be careful. Um, were the, was the train blacked out? We've heard no, some experiences that. when the, the, all the windows were covered in the train and all that. Oh, I was in one train that was like that. Yeah, but I was on several trains at different times. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah. Now you went into the Army Reserve. Um, were you interested in aviation at that time? I don't think particularly so. I, I think the main thing I wanted to do was not be a foot soldier or something, mm -hmm. you know, and in the trenches, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak. Had you flown? No. Um, how did you then get to make that choice about the becoming a pilot to get into aviation training. Kind of take us through what happened from Miami Beach. Well, at Miami Beach, in Miami Beach, uh, they gave you some sort of a choice, evidently. And I chose aviation or what what the hell it was. I don't know whether it was flying back then or not. And from then on, I'm, they just put me into the grist mill, and I went from one place to another, taking primary, basic, and advanced flying training. Mm -hmm. And this was in um, in 40, 1942? Yeah, I would think so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Where did you go for primary? To, um, I think all of it was in Texas. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of some of the names of the places. Lubbock, Texas was one of the three areas mm -hmm. that I trained. I know that. But uh, Take us through the phases of training, though. Um, first there was, is primary the, the first one? Yeah, primary, basic, and advance. And primary is, is there isn't a lot of flight training, as I Recall was there? Or? Yeah, there's there's there is uh, no there's a lot of uh, groundwork so mm -hmm. to speak, but the but the main thing that they do is that they they take you up with an instructor and you fly you get X number of hours flying, but there's always an instructor and you started out with an airplane called a PT nineteen, which mm -hmm. was you know. Um, open cockpit, and all this, and the the uh, biwing biplane biplane, and they had the instructor sat in the rear seat and talked to you, and, and hopefully pulled you out of any. Problem. You both had a stick. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember your very first flight? No, not really. I do remember. <laughs> I do remember the stick bit was. Uh, after about my third or fourth mistake flying at one time, the instructor took this stick back there and went <laughs> wrapped the hell out of my knees. <laughs> I've heard that many times. Have you, you really? You were not the only one. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yes. That uh, that was a very common. Were these um, civilians? Uh, civilian instructors. These were civilians. Um, what, were they good? Oh yeah, and they were. I thought so, and I can just see this guy. I don't remember his name now, but I can just, I, I can just see him. Yeah. You know? When did you solo? God, I can't tell you that. I don't know. Some I, of them have said like after ten or twelve hours. Yeah, I would think it'd be be something like that. In in primary. In primary. Mm -hmm. the other thing I remember is that we we had a black. There was a black dog, good sized black dog that was our, uh, that they had 
adopted him. The mm. guy said adopted him. Kind of the daughter. mascot? Yeah. And that mascot wasn't too damn smart because <laughs> one day he went out on the flight line and jumped at a propeller. Mm. And he was lucky because it just wow. took off a big chunk of his, you know, he just got the tip of the mm. propeller. Wow. Mm. But, you know, but, but the funny part was, uh, um, I think we had tried to rid of this habit because he would always come out when a plane was started and bark at it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just like chasing a car. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, after primary, then what? What's next? Ba basic. Basic. And what's what do you do in basic? Well, in primary, I think you. Uh, I can't remember whether or not you ever flew the airplane by yourself on primary, but I think you did. I think they soloed in, in primary. Yeah, 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 I did a little of that. And yeah. then in, in basic you get into aerobatics and... Yeah, yeah, you get into aerobatics and and emergency landings and uh, us and they taught us, and one thing I remember they taught us that if you get lost, which was not infrequent, mm -hmm. Find a railroad track. Yes. Fly down the railroad track, and when you come to a town on the side of the building, it'll say. What the name of? Right. Saginaw, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> not at not at all uncommon. Yeah. Um, at some point in aerobatics, as I understand it, they determined that you might make a good fighter pilot because of your skill with handling the planes. Was that ever an interest to you, or? No, and as a matter of fact, what happened to me was, or at my time was, they had all the fighter pilots that they needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and all of us became bomber pilots mm -hmm. in my in my in my group, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have any particular. I don't, I don't remember now, but I don't think I had any particular interest in flying fighters over bombers or. Mm -hmm. Anything like that, but and it early on there was a greater attrition of bomber crews. Oh, and pilots. oh, oh, yeah, well, you know uh, the loss rate was over fifty percent in some. <coughs> All right, this is this, this is what they told us. Remember this vividly. The old timers, you mm -hmm. know, that had been around for a while. They said, "All right, we take off." fly over the English Channel and we would have <coughs> spitfires on our wings to guard us. Mm -hmm. When we got to the coast of Europe, spitfires had enough gas to get home, period. And 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 these guys would be telling us this, these stories, you know, we're freezing it. He said he said, you'd turn around and these guys would waggle their wings and go off and you'd look ahead and here's a German airplane's coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> they knew where the line was too, didn't Yeah, they? right, right. Um, in your um, basic training then, you, um, at some point they told you that you were going to be flying bombers? And do you remember the selection process for how you determined what part of the crew, either you were pilot, co-pilot, navigator, or did you get trained in some of all of that? Oh, gee, it's, I have to think about that a little bit. I guess what I'm asking is at what point did they decide you're going to be a pilot? I don't remember that. Uh, I do remember, though, that <clears throat> either on paper or in person, they gave you something of a choice. Mm -hmm. I do remember it wasn't just bingo here, here, here. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I also do remember that is I couldn't find my fanny with both hands, <laughs> I did want to be a navigator. <laughs> See, you know, and mm -hmm. I knew that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they, I think it's just a matter of waiting to see what happened. And mm -hmm. At what point did you get instrument training? Oh yeah, geez, I got instrument training very, very early, 
and um, I'm trying to think. Did you have to wear the hood where the yeah, only thing yeah, you could see oh, was yeah, the... Oh, yeah, yeah, we wore, yeah, they blacked out everything, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, they, they, I think that came very early, you know, when we were... <clears throat> Because if you can't fly with instruments, you can't do much of anything. Because right. the weather was so <laughs> bad over there. Yeah. How did you practice flying? Uh, did you go from did you did you take trips out of Texas where you flew up to? <clears throat> well, the practice flying. This was <laughs> some things are starting to come back here. <clears throat> the practice flying. We would go out, and I'd say to you, <clears throat> you know where the river breaks off down? And I'd say, I'll, I'll meet you there. <laughs> and we'd meet there, mm -hmm. and we'd dogfight, you know, and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and <clears throat> just you know, he did a lot of horsing around because you could, and then I can remember, uh, get lost. I told us to follow the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. and then you could read on the. Did I tell you this already? Yeah, yeah. You uh, could read the name of this town. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that was a very common yeah, uh, yeah. track flying kind yeah. of track navigating. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, at what point did you learn you were going to fly the B twenty four and and did you begin to train specifically for that? And when did you first fly a B-24? Well, the first time, I can remember the first time I <coughs> flew a B-24 was as a co-pilot to watch a fight. And the fighter was Joel Lewis. He was putting on an exhibition and th they took us from our areas and, mm -hmm. and when we flew, I flew on this B-24 and I flew as a co-pilot with this guy and we landed and went in and you know, it's really funny. I can remember some of the most idiotic things. The commanding officer gets in the ring and introduces Joe Lewis, who's a heavyweight champion in the world. <clears throat> and this place is, it's a big hangar. People are up in the rafters of the hangar and all this sort of thing. And this guy introduces Joe Lewis and to the commanding officer. Some guy from up in the you know, yells out, Hit him, Joe. <laughs> that broke up the whole thing. <laughs> but I understand it wasn't uncommon to use the planes. Actually, I, I've talked to other guys who went to friends' weddings, flew to, to various weekend events, uh, because it was practice. It was a way to practice some specific well, location going from point A to point B. And uh, as long as you're going to do that, you might as well do something useful. Well, the only thing I did it once was, was <clears> the <throat> thing that I can recall was <clears throat> I had a sister in Scotland that had never, you know, I hadn't seen in a long, long time. And I went into uh, Major George Player was my commanding officer. <clears throat> and before I flew my first mission, I went in to see him. And I told him, you know, I, my background, all this sort of stuff. And I says, I got my sister. And I says, I'd like to go and see her before I f fly any missions because you don't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> and he said, I remember him telling me, he says, regulations say that before you can have any lead, I might have been making this up, you must fly at least one combat mission. And he says, you fly that combat mission, I'll give you an error to fly up and see her sister. And I did. I flew up to Scotland. <clears throat> and a guy rode along with me as a co-pilot in a B-24. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, he took the plane back, and I took the train back mm -hmm. after I'd been there a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, when did you meet your crew? I met my crew in. Um, gosh, I can see the time. Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs was a staging area for B-24s, mm -hmm. and um, it's got a wonderful big hotel there. Uh, and now it's the home of the Air Force Academy. Well, well it was that. I've been, I, well, I was attached to the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Went out there a few times and mm -hmm. did some duty. Um, Did you fly with the same crew most of the time? Yeah, I had my own. I had my own crew, and of course, that's God. I can't remember half their names now. Yeah, I. But but that was that was sort of standard procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had a crew, and uh, now now sometimes, like uh, Major Player. George Player, who was my commanding officer, uh, he would fly co-pilot with different planes, mm -hmm. you know, just to get a, see what was going on, all this sort of stuff, mm -hmm. I guess. And even though you were a pilot, I suspect your first mission you didn't fly as a pilot, did you? No. You usually fly with the crew for a couple of missions just to kind of right. get, the, get right. the hang of it. That's right. Um, and my first mission was to the uh, pens, the the uh, submarine pens in Kiel. Kiel. Kiel was my first mission. Yeah. Um, and a hell of a lot of flag. <laughs> yeah. The, um, very very common uh, in in most of your missions, I would suspect. Yeah. Yeah. More so than even fighters. Oh yeah, the fighters. You know, after a while, we had pretty much control of the of the sky. You know, but you can't do much about the and the aircraft. Yeah, fire. yeah. Similar to the. Do you see the eighty eight we have outside? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, we did an interview with a, a man who was from Germany and was taken out of high school at the age of sixteen to man uh, an 88 gun in around Munich okay, uh, yeah. and spent over a year doing that and then was captured and turned over to the French. Didn't get back home until like 1947, but yeah. he went down and described uh, using that gun uh -huh. and uh, you know, it was, it was, it was quite a weapon. Uh, oh, we used to, you know, <laughs> you'd fly, th there'd be a lot of near misses. I, th you know, I got a little shrapnel in my wings a couple of times scared the hell out of me, but you didn't know until you got down. But you'd fly through the smoke caused by the explosion. I mean, they got the, they would get you this close, mm -hmm. you know, but you're flying at a certain amount of speed, and this guy's trying to shoot you down, and he leads you, and, he bing, and he's leading you too much, and all of a sudden, you're flying through a big cloud of black, black smoke, you know. Mm -hmm. When you um, when you got your assignment, how did you know where you were going? How did they tell you you were going, for example, to Europe as opposed to the Pacific or? God, I don't know. I don't. How many hours did you have in the B-24 before you went over? Did you, have, did you have much experience? Uh, I don't know. No, no, I didn't have much experience. I helped build them. They had a, they had a bomber plant in Saginaw. Mm -hmm. How was it to fly? Was it a good plane to fly? Yeah, well, of course, it had boosters. It, you know, it's a big, heavy airplane, but it had boosters and. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I think it was a good. <clears throat> but I'll tell you the thing about it was <clears throat> everybody said the same thing. The best aircraft engine was a Pratt Whitney mm -hmm. and my B-24. Not all of them did, right. but yeah. my B-24 had Pratt Whitney engines mm -hmm. and they never let you down. Yeah. This is probably a good time. We have about 10 minutes left on this piece of film. What I'd like to do is have you take this and use that picture. What I'd like you to do is just describe some of the characteristics about that plane and tell us, if you would, where the crew was positioned in, uh, in the aircraft, um, beginning with yourself. Well, all right, the, th uh, the first pilots on the left hand side of the cockpit. <coughs> on the other side is the co pilot. <coughs> this is what the nose we call the nose gunner. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is the waste. We called it the waste as well, of course. Yeah. Those guys are waste. And there were machine guns. On both sides. On both sides of the, of, <coughs> excuse me, of the waste. And, uh. Now there were, but there was just one waste gunner, right? Uh. Or were there, no, were there two? Two, one on each side. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, a navigator? <coughs> God, thank God for that. I couldn't find my ass with both <laughs> hands. And, uh, yeah, there was a, there was a, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, and crew chief. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, well, and like uh, some gunners, did I? Tail gunner? Yeah, there was a tail gunner. <clears throat> so there was a crew of nine? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Okay. And I do remember this. Tail gunner in there. This happened during the war. I didn't have anything to do with this. An anti aircraft burst severed this part from an airplane. Tail gunner was in it. Back here. The thing went down like this. Hmm. And he landed in trees and didn't get scratched. For heaven's sake. They were talking about that. I mean, over there, they were, they mm. were talking mm. about this. For <laughs> heaven's sake. He probably was safer than the rest of the guys in the, in the rest of the right, plane. That's right. <clears throat> How many engines could you lose and still maintain maneuverability and have some chance of uh, making it? Well, you could come back. Well, <clears throat> it would... It would it would fly on two engines, but if it flew on two engines, and I don't remember if I ever this happened to me, but I know it happened to people. You threw every damn thing on that airplane overboard. Oh, I know what it was, um, and and it was and it did happen to me. <clears throat> and it wasn't. I don't know if it was anything to do with the engines or not, but. It had to, but I was coming back from a mission over the English Channel, and the, the white cliffs of Dover. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, I, we were flying pretty close to God. Mother. So, <clears throat> what we did, we threw every damn thing that was on that airplane that was loose out. You know, all the guns and everything came out, and it gave us enough. Lift, lift so that we got over you see the white cliffs of dover christ they're you know i mean you're coming back several just, hundred feet yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah now this is a b24l is that very much like yours as far as i can see as far as i can see were they all painted similar to that or were they silver or well there were some silver ones but they were i don't know what the hell they were for i remember that but uh, well, one of the stories we heard was that actually painting them slowed them down. That if they left them their natural aluminum skin or metal skin, that they were eight to ten knots faster. Well, that could be up. I've never heard that, but it doesn't mean 
that's not so. I, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, do I have, do I have any pictures at home on of my plane? Mm, I don't know. Maybe you do. I just was wondering yeah. that because I'd look at it and see what mm. the hell color it was. Yeah. You know. Well, if you do too, we yeah, we, it'd it be nice to make. It wasn't silver. Okay, it would be nice to make co make uh, copies of those too. Um, did your plane have a name? Oh, it was a joke. No, there's a in my fraternity. Uh, James Brees was a fraternity brother, and I we were always at each other a little bit and they were talking about the war and he said to me what was the name of your plane I said Tom <laughs> <laughs> I broke him up I, every time I see him which is not very often but every few years I tell him that how many missions did you fly? I flew um, 35. Were, was that the limit at that point? Um, they kept raising the limit. <laughs> yes. We have another uh, <clears throat> pilot here, Norm, who, who was a volunteer here, that when he went in it was 25, then yeah, 30, yeah, then, and you know, every, he figured it, he'd never get out of there yeah. because every, and yet one of the things we hear is, uh, again, we've interviewed a couple of, of German pilots. They happen to be uh, uh, ME-109 pilots. Oh, okay. But they said that, you know, that was really one of the main differences between the two units was that you guys had a hope of going home. He yeah. said they never did. It was either the war ended or they died. That yeah, was the yeah, only way yeah, they were going to yeah, get out. Yeah. And it, it became very, very discouraging. Um, oh, of course. God. You know, and yet, was there any anxiety as you got toward the, the latter missions? Did you keep track? Did you always oh, know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We always knew. No, I don't remember that. You know, so you're so damn young. Mm -hmm. you, and they're not going to ever get this guy, but they're not yeah. going to get me. Yeah. You know, that's... Yeah, you're all bulletproof. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, we've got a few more minutes on this. Talk a little bit about that flak. Um, you usually flew missions uh, at uh, pretty high altitude? <coughs> yeah, but there's not an altitude high enough in a B-24 to get out of the range of anti-aircraft guns. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened mostly with it, this, uh, or, or what, what I remember mostly was you're flying along and you're, and you're getting some flak and all of a sudden you're flying through a cloud of black smoke, and there's been a flag burst just ahead of your airplane, or it seemed that way, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you were going in a pretty good clip and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, well, you didn't like flag, but fighters were by far the worst, you know. Mm -hmm. Fighters <coughs> never. You? Did you see any? I saw quite a few, but I don't remember if I, I don't think I was ever under fighter attack. So your, your plane probably didn't shoot down any that you know of? No, no, I don't think so. Um, how was that plane to fly in formation? Oh, it, well, <clears throat> I, I learned to fly on a, <clears throat> about a C, a B twenty four C or something, and it was like, Jesus, you you would you would be in formation, in fifteen minutes you'd be sweating, mm -hmm. because you were flying the damn airplane. Now the later models had boosters, mm -hmm. so that when you made a turn, it boosted it. Or when you pull back on the stick, or the, the, it, it boosted it, mm -hmm. so. It I made mean, it easier to maneuver. And more. Much easier. The latter B-24s were much, and of course, what, the thing about it too is, 
made it much easier for formation flying. Mm -hmm. God, you know. You're... And yet you had to fly in formation because that's the way you got your target. That's how you're. you're yeah, the your... bomb, the bomb pattern. It gives you the bomb pattern. Mm -hmm. Did you ever fly lead? I don't think so. Yeah, I have, yes, I did once, I know, because Major Player was my co-pilot. He was my he was my commanding officer for mm -hmm. the whole but I remember mm -hmm. flying. Did all of your uh, planes have the Norton bomb site? Oh yeah. Yeah. The other, the other thing I remember about Major Player was on my last mission I came in and I overshot the runway. And I thought, oh, Jesus. I said, they're not going to go. I'm not going to. I'm getting down. So when I got about, it felt like about 20 feet. It was probably about five feet. Above the runway, I chopped the throttles. And Christ, I <laughs> blew out a tire and everything else like this. And then Major Blair came up in his staff car. And the first thing he said to me was, nice landing, Wilson. <laughs> I need to change this. <laughs> yeah. Do you need a break? No, I'm fine. Okay. You don't need a pot. You want some water to drink, Tom? Oh, oh, yeah, that, that would be we good. We could find Bob. He can bring in a bottle of water. Oh, yeah. okay. Find uh, one of the guys out there. They can, uh, I noticed you're coughing. Yeah. Back there, <clears throat> I think maybe I tried it quite a little bit. I went back and found they had turned the airfield into a farm. We're recording again, so just go ahead and keep. Go ahead. All right. Well, I got back. I went back there <clears throat> years later, and <clears throat> I could find certain. There were there were a few buildings that were still there. That Wendling was the name of the of the little town, and uh, but they turned it into a farm, and they had built big Nissan huts for storage of grain and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was it was pretty interesting. When you went on these thirty-five missions. Uh, were there missions that you didn't get credit for? I don't f remember that. That you had to turn around perhaps because of the weather or that you didn't? Oh, no, you'd get credit for that. You'd get credit if, if, if you... I don't mean to say that if you took off and turned around and landed, you'd get credit. But if you <coughs> couldn't get, get the target because of weather, that you, you got credit for a mission. Mm -hmm. Or you went to a secondary target. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you have any experiences where you didn't make it back with the group because of damage to your plane, perhaps, or you got separated? The only no, <clears throat> the only thing I can think that's <clears throat> maybe it's a little similar to this. I almost killed myself. My plane was damaged, and I landed in in uh, in uh, France at a one of our airfields, <coughs> and um, it was something that the, the, they could fix in about half an hour. So I don't remember how it was. Now. And I got out and I started kind of walking around and my God damn, here's a fighter plane. Mm. Go ahead. And uh, I think most bomber pilots at one time or other wanted to be a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. So here's this goddamn fighter sitting there, and I get into that plane and get behind the wheel. And God must be watching out for me because I, I, you know, everything was there. You just had to turn the 
ignition and it would open it up. And would, <laughs> but I had second thoughts. Did you um, get out of the, you got your plane fixed and then flew back to your regular base? Yeah. Um, do you remember any particular missions? Do you have a list of, of your missions, for example? I don't think so. I may have. Do you remember any particular ones that were memorable for one reason or another? Well, the worst mission I was on was, I remember, was to kill Germany. It was, it, some people, I think, may have thought it was a, a myth, but it wasn't a myth, and that was that the most accurate anti-aircraft fire was from ships. Mm -hmm. Okay, battleships and stuff like that. And we <clears throat> went on a mission to Kiel, Germany. And shit, you could walk on the flag. And mm -hmm. Kiel, Germany was a big naval base. Mm -hmm. The submarine pens and yeah, so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, that's what we were, where we were attacking the mm -hmm. submarine pens. But... Uh, well, I know the guy that manned the 88 gun told us that what they did is they had radio control and once they found the altitude that the first plane was at, everybody set their fuses for that and they just launched this oh, stuff yeah, three yeah. rounds a minute from, from eight guns in a battery all across the city. Yeah. And as you say, you could you could walk across yeah, it. Yeah. And you're flying in, you have to stay on that, that altitude. Yeah. Um, you dropped usually at pretty high altitude though. You didn't do much low-level oh, bombing. Oh no, 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 no! I, 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 I vaguely remember doing a. I don't know what the hell I bombed, but I bombed something at at, at low level. So low that I could feel a bomb blast. Mm. But it was a that would be something just mm -hmm. out of the ordinary. It wouldn't be. Yeah. There were some specialty things, the dam busters and things like that oh, that, yeah, they, that yeah, they used yeah, for yeah. for specialty kinds of things. But most of it, you were at what, 22,000 or? Yeah, I'm around 22,000, yeah. Um, and you had oxygen? Yeah. And you put it on. After about 14,000 feet? Yeah, but also, you know, we, I, I've had a, I flew a couple of night missions, but I don't remember what it was about. Thank you. And on a night mission, you put the oxygen in on on the ground mm -hmm. because it takes a little while more at night to get your eyes uh, acclimated mm -hmm. to your breathing. And you had um, uh, warming suits lined with um, with uh, metal and plugged it in the on. Those were. That was great, because then you didn't have to worry about freezing your body <laughs> off. How long were most of these missions? How long were you in the air? Well, see, a lot would have to do, of course, with uh, where you were bombing. But um, I, I'd say the longest mission would be eight hours, maybe. You know, that's a really a long mission. A lot of the missions were couple of hours, two, mm. two and a half hours, particularly when, see, I, some of my missions were when they invade, invaded Normandy, Okay. and they sent us in ahead of time to kind of clean up mm -hmm. for the landing troops. So we, we did that before the landing of the... And there might have been some low-level specific oh, uh, terms. Yeah, I, I didn't, I wasn't in on that, but there were... American fighters that were doing a lot of strafing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, were you aware at the time of the enormity of the D-Day preparations and all of that, or was this just part of the routine? No, we weren't aware at all. In fact, <clears throat> once we got in there and saw what was down there, <laughs> wondered what the hell was going on. Mm -hmm. I had a similar reaction. In fact, last week I interviewed a um, man that was in the infantry that landed on Utah Beach. Oh God! And yeah. he said when when dawn came and they were still in the in the ship, he said he looked out and I didn't. He said he didn't think that many ships existed in the world. That's right. It was the most amazing sight. That. 
uh, and yet nobody knew what was going on because you know they don't tell. No. <laughs> you know, they don't tell us. <laughs> no, that's right. How long did it take you to fly your thirty-five missions? Uh, months, weeks? Oh, months. Well, see, be <clears throat> there were sometimes. I remember there were a couple of months we flew one mission oh, okay. a month because of the weather. Okay. You see, the the English weather isn't the best weather <laughs> in the world. Yeah. And uh, uh, we we. Uh, we prepare for mission. Well, when I say prepare, get our, our gear on and all that, and go in and sit down, and they'll, they'll say the mission has been scrubbed, mm -hmm. and everybody applauded. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get those missions? How did you learn of your target? Did you have briefings? Oh yeah, we 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 had a we had a we had briefings, and we know the most notable thing about the briefing was they had. A large map on the wall. We all were sitting back here, like this. and <clears throat> at the critical time, and the guy who was doing the briefing would reach over, and the map was covered, mm -hmm. and he pull something down, and it would open up, and it would be a ribbon showing where you were going. And depending on the length of the ribbon, depended on the length of the mission. Yeah, and and depended on the reaction of the crew. <laughs> <coughs> um, if you flew then in support of D-Day, you were obviously there in in June, so you must have started in essentially in the winter, which would have made the weather probably worse. Anyway, because yeah. we've talked to other pilots who flew sometimes missions every day for two or three days in a row and and uh, I think in fact Norm flew ended up flying 51 missions and did all of those in less than three months um, so it was very much a, a factor of the of the weather oh the Just, weather yeah oh there was no doubt about it yeah that. were most of your missions to Germany or yeah most of them were through Germany we uh, I bombed uh, um, I, I did a couple of missions on um, on France at mm -hmm. the invasion, mm -hmm. you know, we bombed to break up stuff before the troops were landed yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. I think Norm actually, I think he flew prior to the invasion, but he said some of his worst were over Vienna. Uh, they bombed Austria several times, and he said the flak there was just absolutely yeah, it was bad. terrible. I I. Uh, <clears throat> don't know if I bombed Vienna, but I did bomb Austria. Mm -hmm. I know I mean I had at least one mission to Austria, and that was a long haul. Mm -hmm. but, you know. Explain too a little bit about um, you didn't just take off and go to your your uh, target. You had to form up. Uh, oh yeah, and yeah. that took considerable yeah. amount of time. That that extended the. Be able oh, to the length of flight. Yeah. Well, they have a, they had a marker. Um, well, it's just called a marker, but it was a beam, mm -hmm. an invisible beam. But, and you had a, a reader on on your plane that would do this. And what you did was you you, um, let's say the lead plane. You take off and he'd fly to the marker. And he'd circle the marker, and every plane would follow. Him. These were radio beacons, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was now, radio. did you fly in a box? I don't remember that. No, I don't remember a box. The the formation. Yeah, no, I don't think so. It seems to me. You flew in in groups of six. Three six. I think nine. Nine, okay. Nine, yeah. And then there were three groups of nine, because there were twenty-seven in in the yeah. in the squadron, and, and yet and then there would be others you'd have to meet up with. Yeah, there was a there was a meeting point, you mm -hmm. know, or <clears throat> and they had what and the meeting point was 
they have a they had a beam. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Another beacon that yeah. yeah. And then you set off for your target, and you stayed in that formation essentially all the way, no matter what. Yeah. Um, and ri no radio communication. Was I don't remember it no. Was there generally radio silence? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure there had to be. I don't remember. Because they were monitoring. Yeah. Um, and when the flak came, how did you keep your concentration? I mean, <laughs> it seems to me that would be kind of a distraction. <laughs> well, it is, but the thing, you know, what happened with the flak was <clears throat> and you'd be flying through a huge black cloud which means the flag had been, was gone, mm -hmm. but the explosion, the, the remains of it were up there in mm -hmm. the air. And, um, well, it, that was one thing you had no control over, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we, we flew missions, or they, and they flew missions, that, that uh, they'd send planes in to if not silence, subdue the flak. Mm -hmm. You know, fighter planes would go in and strafe them and... The flak suppression units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how did you... Did you get compass headings from your navigator or did you always fly based on the planes around you in terms of knowing where to go? Well, geez. We had a navigator that, and, and you could obviously communicate within the plane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You had yeah, radio. Yeah, yeah. 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 Willie Wilford was mine. Mm -hmm. And then at some point on the bombing run, the bombardier took control of the airplane. Now, did they do that physically, or did they do it by telling you? No, they did it physically. So they had a they had a stick or a control yeah, unit. Yeah, they had a control at the at the bomb site. Yeah. Um, what did you do during that time? Probably prayed a little. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. You were young, you know, and you were you knew if there was anybody shot down, it wouldn't be you. Mm -hmm. You know that sort of stuff. Well, I recently read um, George McGovern's book. He was a also a B twenty four pilot. Yeah, I think I read that. Yeah, book. the um, Wild Blue Yonder. Wild, yeah, I read yeah, that yeah. years ago. One of the things that he remarks is that here he was, twenty years old. They gave him this huge airplane, which was capable of you know massive destruction. Put him in charge of nine guys. Yeah. You know, he his, yeah. their lives were in his hands, and he couldn't even buy a drink. Were you aware of that responsibility? I mean, did you think of those kinds of things, or was this just something you did? It was. It was I don't. I don't. Did you have a sense of responsibility for them? No, it was anything. I, I had the opposite. I wanted them to have a sense of responsibility <laughs> for me. But George McGovern was in Italy. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I, there's no but. I said but. Should say, but mm -hmm. Italy yeah. is Italy. And yeah, yeah. He just happened to be out of uh, yeah. Spinozola or someplace yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, and I think that's been kind of a common denominator with many of them. Uh, the age at which they assume this this tremendous responsibility, and in many ways, I think that was a very maturing. Oh yeah. Uh, experience oh. and kind of contributed to that greatest generation concept that uh, Tom Brokaw left yeah. us with. Um, so when you finished your 35 missions, did most of your crew finish with you? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Do you remember your last mission? It was the one where you had the, the hard landing. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. That part of it, I remember. And then how soon after My last that? mission was, I'm sure, it would, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it was, <clears throat> uh, 
um, preparing for the invasion, you know, mm. or, you know, the be a short trip across the sometime around Seattle. June of forty four. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, how soon after that then did you get get back to the states? You mm -hmm. mean? But I do, I do, the one thing I do remember is that um, <clears throat> when they were sending me home, my commanding officer asked me, he said, he said uh, uh, do you want to, uh, <clears throat> you want to fly a war weary back over the ocean? Mm -hmm. Or uh, go by ship? I said, that's no good. I said, there's no choice there. I'll go on that ship. I don't care if it takes a year to get back. Right now you'd had enough flying. Huh? Yeah, well, particularly when he when he told me when I was going to be flying back, mm -hmm. a B-24 that had been through the war a hundred times. You know. um, then when you got back, um, what did you do? Well, <clears throat> I had uh, gone to, uh, I'd gone through uh, pre-flight training at a school called Ohio Wesleyan, mm -hmm. and uh, I went back there and got my degree. Did you, but uh, when you got back to the States then, were you oh. discharged? No, I did, what the hell did I do? Oh, I was flying navigators. Okay. Yeah, they in out of uh, um, the nearest nice town was Austin, Texas. I can't remember the name of the the town. Okay. But I I flew uh, navigators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the train navig. I didn't train them. I mm -hmm. flew them, and they mm -hmm. shot the stars and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so when you were when you got your wings, you were given a commission. Yeah. And then, were you promoted during these missions? Yeah, yeah. So when you came back, what rank were you? Do you recall? I think I was a captain, but I'm not sure because I, I joined the reserves and retired as a lieutenant colonel. Okay. I know. Okay. So after your active service, then, uh, uh, do you remember approximately when you left the active duty and? and went into the reserves? So you could go back, that's when you went back to Ohio Wesleyan? Well, that would be, God. When I go to Ohio Wesleyan? I don't know. 46? Oh yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, right after the war, mm -hmm. right after the war. So did you stay on active duty through the end of the war in, in Europe, for example, or were you able to get out before that? You earned a, they, were, they had the point system. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had points, uh, let's see. With 35 missions, you'd have been pretty far up on the list. Well, that I can't tell you. Do you remember um, the news about the bombing of Japan? The oh, sure. Bomb? Um, we always ask your, the, your opinion of of that, the use of it. Um, from your standpoint, even though you weren't in the Pacific, um, was it necessary? Based on your knowledge and experience? And well, I'll tell you, I've thought about that on several occasions and I haven't come to any conclusions. Uh, the, the thing that bothers me now, I don't know if it bothered me then or not, was the we didn't hate the Germans. We hated the Japanese. I mean, I, I that bothers me to a certain mm -hmm. extent. You know, that mm -hmm. that that we could uh, hate someone and uh, and then carry out what we did with them. If it had been, well, that's about the only thing I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Did you have a sense of the enemy when you were on your missions? 
I mean, were these people to you, or this was just a place that? Do, do you do you think about those kinds of things? I don't think about them now, but I did at one time. You know, I, did, I went on a mission once, and the navigator always can blame the navigator. <laughs> Um, we were supposed to be in a certain place, we weren't in a certain place. And <clears throat> I dropped the bombs and I wiped out a village, which I assumed that lots of people still living. Not a huge village, mm -hmm. but it was, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that for a while, you know, Jesus. That was Alm, Germany. Alm, Germany. And his grandparents lived there. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. That's right. That's right. Mm. See, it's a good thing when you speak before. <laughs> <laughs> but you do, at some point, uh, realize you know those are people, even though it's the enemy, and oh, some, and yeah, some of them yeah, aren't yeah. necessarily combatants and, yeah, and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. But it's still, it, you have to do it. I mean, it's it's part of what was going on at the at the time. How do you react to this greatest generation concept in terms of the overall duty that you performed? Well, I don't know. I like Brokaw, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's any greatest generation myself. I just think that people do what they have to do and that's it. Well, it's the times and circumstances that make heroes, probably. Oh, well, yeah, sure, yeah. You know, you have the opportunity. On the other hand, I mean, you did perform a duty under conditions that I can't imagine. Uh, you know, I can, I can, I can listen to them, and I, I've done this before, but it's, it's hard for me to imagine actually doing that again and again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we're giving, we're being some. We had uh, dances, and they'd bring the village girls in to dance with us, and we had, oh, we had a lot of fun things, you mm -hmm. know, and I got up to see my grandpa and grandma. Did you have much contact with the local citizens around the airfield, the English? Uh, no, not really. Uh, a few that worked there, that worked on the base, mm -hmm. we did, and uh, I've been back since then, and once, and uh, found, uh, I don't remember if I, I found a house that I knew, and I don't remember what, what, what happened, whether I, saw the people there or not, but I know I went looking. Mm -hmm. for the, I went back to the base and it's all farmland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Which is probably what it was before that. Yeah, uh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, you got out of the service, now you stayed in the reserves and, and did you still, did you keep on flying? No, no. Have you flown since? You didn't get a private pilot's license or anything? No. No I desire don't. to do that? Well, I got did, you know, I went, went to college right off the bat and all this, and then I did, I, I stayed in the reserves for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, yeah, I did, because my promotions were all in the reserve. Now, were they in the Air Force, or? Did... Yeah. So that um, you were still connected with aircraft, or the at least the Air, the Air Force? Yeah, I was attached to the Air Force Academy for mm -hmm. A while. This blonde girl just looked in here. <laughs> um, okay, you you graduated from Ohio Wesleyan. What what did you major in, and what what did you do after that? What did I major in? English. Majored in English and taught English. I graduated and became a teacher. Mm -hmm. At what what grade levels? What uh, high, high school? High school. Yeah. Um, and uh, you met your wife. Your first wife. 
Oh, Jane. Wait a minute. No, I, I knew she had a sister. My first wife had a sister that was my age, roughly my age, I guess. And <clears throat> used to have dances after school or something like that. And I know I danced with her a couple of times. And she introduced me to her younger sister. And uh, that's all she wrote. Yeah. And you got married then after after you graduated from college or Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did you settle to when you taught? Where 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 did you live while you were teaching? In Saginaw. So you went back to yeah. Saginaw after graduating from Ohio Wesleyan? Yeah. Um, and uh, did you have children from that marriage? Five. Can you give us their names? I wrote them down for me. <laughs> she wrote them down for me. Oh, okay. What do you want now? The names of the uh, your your children. Tommy, Laura, Sandy, Peggy, and Linda. And um, do you know? Are they still living? And do you know? Oh yeah, Tommy just left Palm Springs what a week or so ago. A couple weeks ago. He's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Is he going to be in the future? Sure. Hey. <laughs> you. After, no, after, at 83, you're entitled to <laughs> yeah. say what you think. U.S. citizen, what grant did you get to go to, oh, the University of California? I told you that, didn't I? No, not yet. Go ahead. Uh, John Hay. John Hay Fellowship. Hmm. John Hay was. What the hell was he? He was a a politician, and I used to know a lot about him, but I don't. I don't know now. But what he did, among other things, was establish. Uh, scholarships for people who qualified for them. And I don't know how to, you qualified. And uh, did you get to go to the University of California? Yeah, and I went to I went to University of California, Berkeley. Mm. And got a degree there. Yeah. But you continue to teach in mostly in public schools. Yes. Always done. We have something in common. I was high school librarian here in Palm Springs for 35 years. So oh yeah. I just retired yeah. a couple years ago. Oh, oh yeah. Um, that, and that's really my connection with the museum here. I set up the library for them when it first opened in the 90s. Oh great. And continued to work. And then when I retired, this is a oh. natural place to come. It's a yeah. it's it's a great place. It's a, it's a great line of work. If yeah. if you can stand the kids, it's it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not bad. <clears throat> um, so, so tell us a little bit about what you've done since then. You um, you eventually retired from teaching, um, and um, well, I liked golf, and um, I was a tennis player in college. I played tennis and all this sort of stuff. And what I do now is um, I work. Well, you can't really call it work, but. <laughs> at the University of Michigan golf course where there are friends of mine work there and it's, it's kind of a just, mm -hmm. you know. And I um, uh, work behind the counter and every once in a while I uh, range, just go out and be sure nobody's cheating on each other. So that's about it. Mm -hmm. How did you meet Marlene? I don't remember that. <laughs> We've been together for we've been together now for thirty six years. Yeah. I work for the schools and he worked for the schools. Yeah. So you met uh, while he was right. teaching. Did you teach? No, I was an administrative secretary. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in in uh, in mm -hmm. Saginaw. 
No, no, no. He really was in Saginaw only a short time. Then he come on over here. Come then on. he taught. Come on, sit on the camera. Okay. Okay. Then he taught uh, at the high school in Ann Arbor. Okay, so th that's Pioneer your connection. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, had, moved, you yeah. had moved to Ann Pioneer Arbor. Pioneer High School is where he retired from. Okay. And that's where he was, a tennis coach and a golf coach. Okay, so you also did some coaching as well as yeah. teaching English. And yeah. Good, good. It's Again, it's it's a great occupation if you can stand the kids. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you can stand the kids. How did you uh, come to uh, find Palm Springs? Oh, wait a minute. I've been there before. Have well, you come? We have we have friends that live in Carmel mm -hmm. and summer in, in Ann Arbor. And so we vacationed in Carmel with them and during that vacation we drove to Palm Springs and immediately fell in love with them. Oh yes. Well that's good. Immediately. That's good. So it's our fifth year here. So you come out um, mm -hmm. for for Two a time months. in the in the winter time. Okay. Where do you stay? Uh, we went to a uh, condo right off of uh, Ramon and Farrell. Mm -hmm. Right off the golf, right next to the golf course. You know, statistically, they say this: there are more veterans in the Coachella Valley than any other place in the world per capita. Well, is that right? And what we found in talking to them is, you know, many of them trained somewhere around here, either at Miramar in San Diego or someplace. Yeah. And of course, Patton trained throughout this area. There's yeah. the Patton Museum up at Chiriaco Summit. Yeah. In fact, I go to St. Teresa Catholic Church down here on Ramon and Farrell. Yeah. Well, that used to be his headquarters. Uh, my son went to Catholic school there, and when he started uh, 20 years ago, they were actually going to school in the old barracks buildings from his uh, uh, company headquarters, and our parish hall was his headquarters company building. Oh. They've since built new buildings, but uh, Patton has a very large legacy. He has a home in Indio. Uh, oh. He wasn't there very long, but his wife maintained it. In fact, they're arguing now about whether it should be a historical spot. But well, what we found then is that all the veterans who went through here said to their spouses or remembered, when we retire, we're going to we're going to remember <laughs> to Coachella Valley and and many of them did. And it's it's been great for the museum. In fact, it's one of the reasons the museum is here and to have the docents uh, here who actually flew those planes and and uh, were veterans makes it a much wow. more uh, enjoyable experience. Well, we visited Patton at the museum when we drove mm -hmm. out here. A yeah. couple years ago, remember? We yeah. Up at Baton. Yeah. And then Our Lady of Guadalupe mm -hmm. Church, that's the oldest church here. Isn't yes, it? yes, yes. And then I, I've gone to, uh, no, Our Lady of Guadalupe isn't the oldest. Isn't there one downtown that's older that the movie studies must have been? Well, um, Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Solitude. Oh, okay. Are you know right close to each other, <laughs> right, and, and right. I don't know which one is older, but they've both been here since the twenties. That's a cute little church. Yeah, Quite yeah, open. yeah. Frank Bogart, in fact, uh, was one of the founders oh. there. Uh, oh, why do I know that name? Bogart. Well, Frank Bogart was our mayor for years. Um, he's now ninety-six. In fact, we just did an interview with him. He was uh, also a uh, World War II veteran. And uh, he was mayor of Palm Springs for years, and and uh, has been all over the you know yeah, the, the cowboy. Know that, yeah, I, yeah, I know that name. Uh, too. Yeah, I'm sure you couldn't be in Palm Springs too long without. No. His, that's his statue out in front of City Hall over by the airport. Uh, oh, okay. On the horse. Yeah. That's 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 yeah, Frank. Yeah. That's yeah. Frank Bogart. Yeah. And of course, Tom's second love is Frank Sinatra, and he visits oh, this is his perfect. grave. There twice. you go. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything else I haven't asked you about that you'd like to, to tell us or, you know, one of the things we kind of finish up with is if, as you're talking to your children, what do you tell them about your experiences in the war or did you talk about it with them? I don't think I talk about it, but not because I'm suppressing them, but it just, uh, my kids um, are widespread. You know, they're all mm -hmm. over the place now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, they'll have a copy of this tape, which is going to be nice for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Except for the one that's the pink. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to get that out of there. Well, to do your magic. I hope we haven't left anything out, and I hope we've done honor to your service. It's certainly always a privilege for us to do this, and we appreciate you taking time to tell us your story. One of the things we've discovered is while there is a sameness to some of it, they're all unique because they're your yeah, particular yeah, story. Yeah. And um, 
we thank you very, very much for taking well, the time to do this. Well, thank you for and, doing uh, it. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Oh, I just could move this. Yes, well, take your time. We're not in any no. hurry. There's. Is that off? Um, not yet. <laughs>